Friends, I want to ask this morning, how do you approach God when you have a need? Now, no doubt this woman was greatly distressed about what was going on with her little daughter. As a dad, I know how it feels when you have a sick child. So I understand this woman's desire. I understand her desire to see her child healed. She sees an opportunity for that child to, to be freed from the bondage to that demon that had inflicted and it was causing so much pain. And so she comes and she falls at Jesus' feet. How do we approach God with our needs? are turning to Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. That's going to be our text today. And as always, I'm going to ask that you stand for the reading of God's Word. Uh, make sure you keep your Bibles open because we want you to follow along as we go through the time in, in God's Word in your Bibles. But we want to stand together and read this passage of Scripture in unison because we want to hear God's voice, God's Word in our voice. That has a way of helping us to really open our ears and to really hear what God is saying to us in the text. So would you join me as we begin at verse 24. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered, and at the table, feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for moving on Mark to record that in the life of Jesus. And Lord, we want to hear it today with new ears. We want the Holy Spirit to truly speak to our hearts and help us to understand what You're communicating to us through Your Word that, that God, You def desperately want us to hear today so that we can obey it and, and we can get in line with it because we know, God, Your Word is truth. And we desperately want to obey it. So Father, I pray that you would just speak loudly and help us to understand and to see exactly what you want to say to us. We pray this in Jesus' name and everybody say it. Amen. You can be seated. The title of the message today is A People Problem. Jesus in this particular text is having... A people problem. Who in here has ever had a people problem? Yes, we all can relate. Here we see in the first verse of our text that Jesus retreats from the, the area that he's been teaching in. And he goes into Tyre, which is a Gentile area. And we're told that it was Jesus' um, desire that he pull away from the crowd. And, and no doubt he also wanted to remove himself and his disciples from the press of the Pharisees and the scribes. As you recall, as we began in chapter 7, we see Jesus being under assault by the leaders of, of Judaism and the law, and, and they really, they've been coming at him and trying to catch him in something that he might say so that they could accuse him. So he's having this long-running dispute, and so no doubt Jesus wants to remove himself from this so that he can get some rest and give the disciples a chance to rest as well. But now despite his effort, people hear that he's there in Tyre, and they flock to him. And so Jesus has a people problem here. 
He's trying to rest and recover, but people are coming to him. Now, specifically, we're told in verse 25, there is a certain woman that seeks Jesus out. Apparently, her little daughter was inflicted with an unclean spirit that was causing her to be sick. And this woman comes and she falls at Jesus' feet. Now that is really interesting because remember, Jesus is in a Gentile area. He's in a, a pagan area where people are not looking at him as the Messiah. Now certainly the fact that a crowd was drawn to him indicates that this area had heard maybe about the miracles that Jesus had been performing. They had heard about the teaching. So they hear this, this, this Jewish holy man is, is around so they come together. But this woman comes in a very different manner. She comes and she bows at Jesus' feet. She falls at His feet. Now certainly this was an indication that she was giving Jesus respect. She was, she was submitting to Him and maybe even offering Him worship, indicating that she saw Him as more than just some, some religious teacher, some Jewish rabbi. She comes and she prostrates herself at Jesus' feet. Friends, I want to ask this morning, how do you approach God when you have a need? Now no doubt this woman was greatly distressed about what was going on with her little daughter. As a dad, I know how it feels when you have a sick child. I would much rather myself be sick than my children, especially when they were small. You know, you can recall when your children were small and those fevers would spike 103, you know, 102 and a half, and it would just scare you to death. And you would desire anything in the world to see that child well again. You would almost do anything if that child could just overcome that sickness. So I understand this woman's desire. I understand her desire to see her child healed. And she sees an opportunity for that to happen in the person of Jesus. She sees an opportunity for that child to to be freed from the bondage to that demon that had inflicted and it was causing so much pain. And so she comes... And she falls at Jesus' feet. How do we approach God with our needs? Do we approach Him arrogantly demanding His attention? God, I'm one of your people. You've got to listen to me. Do we approach Him flippantly or casually with a strong sense of entitlement? God, I come to church every Sunday. I tithe. I serve in a ministry. You have to hear me and you have to do what I'm asking because of all I've done for you. How do we approach God? Do we approach Him like this woman? You know, she understood that she didn't deserve for God to do anything for her. She was not Jewish. She was not one of the the people of God. She didn't approach Him demanding. She didn't approach Him with a sense of entitlement. She did what only she could do. She fell at Jesus' feet. She prostrated herself before Jesus and threw herself on His mercy. Mark elaborates in verse 26 some things about this woman that tell us why she would think in her mind that it was very unlikely that she would be helped by God from a human perspective. You know, she had some things that were against her. And Mark takes great care in verse 26 to kind of list those for us. First of all, she was a woman. In that day, women were little more than property. And certainly this woman would have no reason to to come and demand anything of God because she was merely a woman. She was also a Gentile. 
Which meant that she wasn't part of the covenant people of God. She was a, a pagan, an outsider. And she had no right to make any demands or, or to make any request of a God that she was alienated from. Specifically, we're told that she was of the Syrophoenician race. And that, that might not mean much to us in here this morning, but it meant something to Mark's original hearers. You see, the Syrophoenician people had done great harm to the people of Israel in their history. And so there was bad blood like you wouldn't believe between the Syrophoenicians and the Israelites. So this woman, again, had no reason to think that God would even care about her, much less hear her request to free her daughter from this, this demon. So she comes, and she just falls at Jesus' feet making no claim, giving no argument as to why he should listen to her. She just comes and falls before him, begging for mercy. Friends, have you ever noticed that typically when we read the Bible, specifically when we read the New Testament, we often identify with the wrong character in the story. Have you ever noticed that? I'll give you an example. The, the parable of the prodigal son, Luke 15. Probably Jesus' most famous parable. You know, the, the young man decides he doesn't want to live in his father's house anymore, so he, he leaves, he goes out to the far country, he loses all of his inheritance, he comes back and, and he begs his daddy to let him back in the house. You know that story? Every time I teach that, preach that, most people want to identify with the prodigal son. But in reality, whether we want to admit it or not, we are much more like another character in the story. One that shows up at the end. You, you remember the older brother? The one that got angry when he saw the father lavishing the, the gifts on the young son who had left the father's house and had wasted all, according to the, to the older brother, had wasted all of his father's money on harlots and, and, and wild living. He gets angry when he sees the father put the, the family robe on the son. He, he gets mad when the father takes the signet ring off of his hand and puts it on the returning son. He gets angry when he sees him putting sandals on the feet of the younger son. He gets really mad when he hears his father say, Hey, go kill the fattened calf because we're going to have a party tonight because this son of mine who is lost has been found. This one who was dead is now alive again. He gets angry. He won't even go in the house. He stands outside and so the father comes out to him. And this older brother looks at his father and says, what you're doing is not right. Here you are making a fool of yourself honoring this son who cursed you and left you and wasted all of your stuff. And here you are receiving Him back as a son. Friends, if we're honest in here, we're much more like that son than the other son. And you see, I'm afraid that we do the same thing with the text that we're talking about this morning. See, we fancy ourselves to be one of the disciples, the ones on the inner circle with Jesus, when in fact, Every one of us in this room is just like this woman. We're Gentiles. I don't know about you, but I've done God much harm in my life through sin. I have no right or reason to come before God and demand anything from Him. I have no entitlement in and of myself that would say that, God, you owe me something. How about you? My only approach to God should be bowing humbly at His feet 
and worshiping Him, honoring Him, respecting Him. This woman shows us something tremendous in her attitude and how to approach God. Verse 27, though, something very surprising happens. What's up with Jesus' response to this woman? Doesn't sound very Jesus-like, does it? He says to her, let the children be satisfied first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Men, the last thing you better ever call a woman is a dog. Amen? Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. What in the world is Jesus doing here? I mean, if you look at Scripture, it's common in the Old Testament for Gentiles to be referred to as dogs. That's the level of, 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 of hostility that dwelt between Israel, the people of God, and everyone else that wasn't a part of the, 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 the people of God. And when they used the word dog, it literally meant like a vicious mongrel dog, not a, not a tame dog, not a dog that, that you'd want to go pet. Kind of like the coyotes that are out around our area. You hear them at night sometimes if you live outside the city limits in the country like we do. You can hear them howling in the nighttime. You don't want to pet those things, by the way. You don't want to try to approach them. Christy, stay away from the coyotes. You don't want to mess with them because they're, they're not tame. They're, they're vicious and they, they want to eat you. They, they see meal when they see you. And, and so this was not something that you would want to say. It was, it was really a slur. What in the world is Jesus saying? And you know, if you look at Matthew's account of this particular story, it gets even worse. Jesus responds to the woman, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. So here, not only in Matthew's account, is not Jesus calling her a dog, He's actually saying, look, I didn't come for you kind of people. What in the world is Jesus doing here? Doesn't sound like Him, does it? You know, no, liberal scholars have taken this passage of Scripture and tried to use it as a way of saying that Jesus was not sinless as, as, a, as a man on earth. He was not sinless. Because this is po- proof positive. He sinned against this woman by using a racial slur and, 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 and demeaning her in this way. So what is it? What is Jesus doing here? Why would He use this kind of language? Well, I believe that Jesus is saying this to her, not for her benefit, but for the benefit of the disciples. This, like everything in this chapter so far, has become a teachable moment. Now, Matthew's account makes it clear that the disciples were aware of this woman's request. In fact, Matthew records that Jesus doesn't say anything to her, and the disciples approach her and say to Him, send this woman away because she keeps shouting at us. So Matthew makes it clear that the disciples were aware of what was going on. They were there. And so I believe what Jesus is doing here, He's sounding out what is in the disciples' hearts. They see this woman as a nuisance. This woman is bothering us. And people like her have no right to approach you because she's not the right kind of person. She's not of the house of Israel. She's a Gentile. And you need to send her away. So Jesus is simply sounding out for them what is in their hearts. Now, it's interesting, that word dog. Jesus specifically chooses a word here when He says dog. If you look at this this term, this Greek term, 
that is, is, is translated dog in our text, it's not the mongrel type dog that would typically the word would have been used. It, in fact, it literally means a little dog. A household dog. A pet dog. So he's not calling her a mongrel. He's calling her a pet dog. Now some of you are saying that don't make it any better, Pastor. He's still calling the woman a dog. He's using a play on words and it's very obvious from the woman's response that she understands what Jesus is doing there. Jesus' message to the disciples is very similar to the point that, that he made just in the text before this about food. You remember that? That discussion about what defiles a person? It's not the food that goes into a man that defiles him. It's what? It's what comes out of the heart. And Mark puts in there that's, that, that, he, that Jesus declared all foods clean. He's making the same point, but only about people. There's no food that can defile you. And likewise, he's saying, there are no unclean people that are beyond God's grace. He's declaring that His grace is not only for the covenant people of God, but it's also for the Gentile. He makes the same thing point to, to Peter in Acts chapter 10, remember Peter has been sent by the Holy Spirit to the house of one Simon the Tanner and while he's up on the rooftop at noonday prayer, he gets this vision of this, this thing coming down from, from heaven and on it are all these unclean animals and he hears the voice of God say, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. And he protests. He says, no God, from youth I have not eaten anything unclean. And God says to him in that vision, Peter, don't you call unclean what I have called clean. And immediately, as soon as he has this vision, here's a knock on the door, and he finds a delegation from a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman centurion, a pagan Gentile, and he too had gotten a vision from God that he was to send people to one Simon the Tanner's house because there was a man there that had a message from God for him and his whole household. And so Peter goes... And as Peter opens his mouth to, to teach them, he says in verse 28, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. I believe Jesus in this text is delivering the same message to His disciples. You see this woman that's coming and falling at my feet? She's worthy of my attention. Because you see, I love her too. She's not this unclean person that has no access to God, no hope for redemption. This woman has within her the capacity to be loved by God, to be forgiven by God, to be accepted by God. Friends, how do we see people? Do, do you think that there are some people that are more deserving of God's attention than others? Don't answer quick. Don't answer quick. Does God see something redeemable in people that we would shun or turn away? If they don't look like us, if, if they don't have the same income level as we do. They don't speak our language. If they don't vote like us. Are we really quick to condemn people? 
because we're uncomfortable by their presence. The disciples wanted this woman gone. She's bothering us. They looked at the woman and saw a problem. Jesus looked at the woman and saw something precious. How do we see people? I get it. People can get on your last nerve. Amen? There are people that I am in proximity to that get on my last nerve. None of you, by the way. None of you. There are people that I would, if I could, avoid. And don't look at me like that, all self-righteous. You do it too. Amen? There are people that I just don't think God ought to love. How about you? There are not there are people that I just don't understand why God hadn't dropped fire on them yet. And then you know what I think after I think that thought? Wait a minute, if God hadn't dropped fire on me yet, that probably explains why He hadn't dropped fire on them. Friends, how do we see people? As problems? Or do we see them as having potential to come to know Jesus? In verse 28, this woman shows you something. She says to Jesus, Yes, Lord, but even the little dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. She uses the same word for dog that Jesus uses. She acknowledges that she has no right to ask for anything of God. You know, I'm not sitting at the table, Jesus. I'm under the table. So she's showing great humility here. But she's saying, I'm under the table. And so I'm calling out for your gracious, undeserved help, the crumbs that come off the table, that's all, and notice her faith, that's all that's required, Jesus. If I can just get a crumb of your grace, that's enough to free my daughter from this demon. Do you see the faith that this woman is placing in the person of Jesus? Just a crumb. Just a crumb, that's all I need, a crumb. She's humbling herself and showing tremendous faith. And I might add that she's demonstrating a deeper understanding of Jesus' mission than the disciples who were seated at the table with Jesus. Why is that? How could this pagan woman appear to know more and recognize more about who Jesus is than the disciples that sat at the table with Him. I mean, we've, been, we've seen this all throughout the Gospel of Mark where the disciples just seem to be dense sometime. Amen? They, they don't seem to get it. How could this woman seem to know more? Friends, I think it's because of her awe of Jesus. See, sometimes I think that I've become way too comfortable with Jesus. How about you? I get it. We live in a day when we want Jesus to be our homeboy. We, we want Jesus to be our friend. We want Jesus to, to relate to us in a casual manner. And, and I'm thankful that we do have that kind of desire for relationship. That's not a bad thing to, to want to have a personal connection to Jesus. 
I think that's a, a, a great improvement over some of the stoic faith that we've seen in the past where people have this reverence attached or the, and the way they define the word reverence attached to Jesus where He doesn't connect with who we really are. He's over here, up here, and He doesn't really understand anything about being down here because we've so detached Him from our everyday existence. You see, that even denies the incarnation. Jesus left the glory and majesty of heaven and He humbled Himself and He came in the form of a man and He experienced everything just like we do, yet without sin. It's the wonder that Jesus would come and dwell among us. And I think it's a great thing to acknowledge that, that He came and He was a man just like me and He dealt with everything we deal with, but do not use that as an opportunity to rob Jesus of His glory. While He is 100% man on He's still 100% God. Jesus is not your homeboy. He is not merely your friend. He's God. And we need to recapture some of that all in the modern church. Because you see, when we, when we recapture that all, it reminds us how amazing it is that God would give us grace. Amen? We stop approaching God so casually as if we deserve it. And we begin to see that we're just like this woman who has no right, no reason to expect anything from God, but we come and we get before God, we humble ourselves in His presence, we come and we approach Him with worship and awe, and we call out to Him and we ask Him for a crumb. We ask Him for a crumb. Jesus responds to this woman. I love how Matthew ties the faith to it here. And, and, and Mark, Mark just simply says, because of this saying, it has been done for you what you've asked. Arise and go. And we find when she gets home that the little girl has been freed from the demon. But Matthew actually inserts Jesus saying to her, because of your faith. Because of your faith, it's been done. Friends, we've said many times here at Riverbend that I don't want to continue to drive it home. Faith always has an object. Faith is not this thing in and of itself. You don't just have faith. You have faith in something or someone. Here, this woman has faith in Jesus. I'm coming and I'm bowing before Him and I believe that He's able to do exactly what I'm asking Him to do. I believe that Jesus is the key to my little daughter being free from this demon. I believe that Jesus, if you just drop a crumb from the table, that my daughter is going to be free. And Jesus commends that faith. If Jesus were to come and walk into River Bend Church this morning, would He find that kind of faith? Jesus said a faith like that, just the size of a mustard seed, can move a mountain. But will Jesus find that kind of faith at Riverbend. Do, do we look at Jesus as the sovereign Son of God? Do, do we look at Him as the one that was sent to bear 
the penalty that we had earned for our sin, who gave His life, willingly laid it down on the cross so that we could be reconciled to God, our sin cost Jesus His life. Excruciating death because of what we did. Do we see Him as that Savior who willingly gave His life for us? Do we see how ugly our sin is? Do we see the cost of our sin? Or have we casually removed that from our our memory so that we can be comfortable with the fact that we're going to keep right on sinning? Instead of understanding exactly what our sin did, To Jesus. Do we see Jesus as God? Or is He merely some some person that, that we look to when things get rough? You know, when things aren't going right in my life, I'm going to call out to Jesus. And then when stuff starts going right, I'm going to conveniently forget Jesus and go about my merry way because everything is as I want it. Let me tell you, Jesus is the same whether you're in a a valley or whether you're on a mountaintop, whether you're in a problem or in a good time. Jesus is the sovereign Son of God. He is God. He is on the throne. And He demands and deserves our worship. He demands and deserves us falling at His feet. Not approaching Him with some sense of entitlement. Here I am, Jesus, bless me. Because it's me. It's me. You know, Pastor Steve. Yeah, I'm the guy that pastors the church. I preach the sermons. I'm the godly guy. I never sin. Here I am. You owe me, God. Don't you see my given statement to the church? You owe me, God. I haven't missed a Sunday all year. You owe me, God. God owes me nothing. He owes me nothing. In fact, we want to talk payment. You know what I've earned from God? Judgment. I deserve judgment because I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This morning, I'm not talking about past sinned. I have sinned Today, in fact, I've probably sinned within the last ten minutes while I'm preaching. You might say, how is that possible? All things are possible with a sinner, guys. All things are possible. God owes me judgment. So why would I even think of approaching God with a sense of entitlement? Why would I even think about approaching God casually? You know, who spent some time reading the Old Testament before? Please tell me you have. Please make me feel good. Raise your hand. It was a really serious thing to go into the temple in the Old Testament. Amen? You know, the high priest could go into the holiest of holies one time a year. Now, if you remember how the temple was set up, you had the outer court where, you know, Gentile proselytes and, and women could be. Sorry, ladies. Then you had another court. It was called the court of men. The, the male Israelites, uh, you know, could go into there. And, and then you had in, uh, an inner court where only the priests could go. But then you had the holy of holies. Now, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Who in here has seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah, the thing that made the Nazi guy's face melt. The Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy 
of holies. And inside the ark were the, the tablets of the testimony that God gave Moses up on the Mount, on Mount Sinai, the law. That was in there. And one time a year, the high priest could go in there and what he would do is he would go in and make intercession for the people. Give a sin offering to God one time a year covering the sin of the whole nation once for that year. And every year he had to go and do it again. But you know what they would do? When he would go into the most holy place, it was separated by this great veil and some say that it was about six feet thick that separated the profane from the holy of holies. They would tie a rope to the high priest. He had bells on the bottom of his robe. And so as he would go in and begin to minister before the presence of God, because God's glory, God's presence dwelt in that room. Because God said so. That's where I'm going to dwell. And so they would listen as he's in there ministering. And if they stopped hearing the bells, you know what they would discern? He did something wrong and God killed him. It doesn't sound like God, does it? Ask Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Eli was the high priest. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Eli was not home one day. I'm, I'm killing this story, but he wasn't home one day and Hophni and Phinehas decided we're going to go in there and make, a, make an offering. They offered strange fire before the Lord, unauthorized fire, unauthorized sacrifice before God. You know what happened? Fire came out of the altar of God and consumed them. You don't think God's serious? What about the dude that Uzzah? David was having the ark of God brought back from the Philistine household. And instead of carrying the ark of the covenant like they were supposed to, that God was very specific in the law. You don't just handle the word, the, 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 uh, the ark of the covenant any old way. The, the Levites were told to put poles through these little, hole, these little uh, things that were built into the ark. They were to carry it. Well, they decided we're going to build a cart. And we're going to put the ark of the covenant on a cart. And we're going to take it into town. Well, as they were going, one of the oxen stumbled. And so the, the, the cart was you know, doing this number and the ark was about to fall off. And this dude named Uzzah reaches out and, and steadies the ark. Now that's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, Uzzah was just trying to be helpful. He didn't want God's ark to hit that ground and be defiled. So he reaches out and he touches it. You know what happened to Uzzah? He died. Well, that's not right. That's not fair. You know what Uzzah assumed? He assumed his hand was more righteous and undefiled than the dirt that that ark was getting ready to hit. Are you getting what I'm laying down? Why is it we in the New Testament church think that we can come so casually and so flippantly before the presence of God. Maybe it's because we're afraid we're afraid to let God be God. Because we would prefer to be God. I make up the rules. I decide what's right, what's wrong. I determine who's in and who's out. I create a church that I'm comfortable with. Friends, we need to stop creating churches that we're comfortable in. And we need to start creating churches that God is comfortable in. We need to understand 
This woman demonstrated a deeper understanding of Jesus than most people that you'll meet. And so I ask you today, who is Jesus to you? How do you approach Him? Does the Jesus that you say you know, does He look anything like the Jesus in Scripture? Does, does the one that you say you love, does He look like who we see in Scripture? Or are you, have you created in your mind a Jesus that, quite frankly, looks a lot like you. We want to cast God as just a, a little bit higher than us. I mean, we laugh at the Roman pantheon, in the Greek pantheon, don't we? I can't believe them people would, would, would worship gods who were so imperfect. I mean, they were always fighting amongst themselves and being, being deceitful. I mean, why would anybody worship a God like that? They literally created gods that look just like them. And yet, what have we done? What are we doing? Are we creating gods that look like us so that we feel more comfortable? See... I'm afraid that in our zeal to make people comfortable with God, we're actually putting them in a much worse condition. You know, C.S. Lewis talked about, you know, Christian, his faith in Christ is like an infection, a good infection. And he worried that what we were doing to people was we were giving them an inoculation. You know, giving somebody a shot, like for instance the flu shot, when you give, take a flu shot, guess what's in the shot? Flu. The reason they, they stick you with flu is so your body can build up natural immunity against that germ. So if the germ's out here trying to get in, your body says, oh no, I already got that in there, I already fought that off, so you ain't coming in here. That's how I envision that goes on inside of me. And C.S. Lewis said it's the same thing what we've done to people with faith. We've given them just enough of the truth about Jesus Christ, just enough of the gospel truth to inoculate them to the real thing. Have you got a true faith in God that causes you to prostrate before Him and acknowledge that He is God. That you don't try to tell Him what to do. You don't try to, to, to name it and claim it. Guys, I, that, I'm not going to go on that because if I get on that, I'm going to be on that for about 30 minutes. Yeah, I am going to get on that for just a second. These people who start telling you to start naming stuff and claiming stuff, Oh, I, you have to take authority. You have to stand up and take authority and say, oh no. You know what kind of authority you and I have? It's called a delegated authority. It comes from God. I'm afraid we're more like the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts. We're up here you know, saying, hey, we've seen Paul cast these demons out and that looked pretty cool. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to cast demons out too because we want people looking at us and saying, look at them. So they go to calling out demons and guess what happens? The evil spirit looks at them and says, well, hold, hold up. Jesus I know. Paul I know. But I ain't got a clue who you are. And the evil spirit jumped on them and beat every one of them, seven of them, and sent them out bloody. That's what kind of authority we have. See, we need to start coming like this woman. Humble. Not demanding. Understanding the, the deep grace that God has poured on our lives so undeservedly. Never get over that, church. Never get over the fact that God has poured this grace on you. 
This forgiveness, this mercy that He's poured. Never get over that. Never get to a point that you think you deserve it. Never become that person that looks down on somebody else who is sinning because you don't sin in that manner. Never forget that you are a sinner saved by grace. And were it not for the grace of God, you would be a dirty, horrible sinner just like everybody else. Never forget that. Never take it for granted. Never think you deserve it. Just fall humbly at His feet. And say, Jesus, here I am. Never, ever get off your knees before God. Stay humble. Stay prostrate before God. People problems. You know what I've discovered? The person I have the most problem with in my life is me. Is me. And guess what? The person you have the most problem with in your life is you. Jesus shows us the way. Let's prostrate ourselves at His feet and worship Him because of the grace that falls off of His table. Amen? Would you stand with me?